I'm focusing on trying to get a, people to know about something that's coming up. This book that I've been working on for a very long time. This is not the real copy. This is a, a uh, proof copy, but it's April 5th coming out. Uh, on April 5th, this book, Create, Connect, Repeat. It's kind of um, all the things that we do with outside of music, all the things I do consulting-wise for marketing plans and stuff for different artists and all these kind of things um, kind of distilled into one book. And I kind of wrote it mostly during 2020, 2021, and then finally getting it out uh, this this uh, April. So I'm excited about that. April 5th, we'll be doing some events, so some of the Q&As around that time. April 5th is also a Tuesday, so definitely on Tuesday, April 5th, uh, talking all things Create, Connect, Repeat. She says, it's a very insightful book and has been useful for me. Works for musicians in all genres. Yeah, it was intended for musicians of all genres. It's definitely applicable to any genre, the Create, Connect, Repeat book. It's pretty, uh, it, it, I mean, it's, from the vantage point, some of the examples are definitely jazz centric because I'm a jazz musician. But um, the the overall, it could be for anything really. It doesn't even only have to apply to musical projects. It could be any project. You know, the only thing that actually matters, like the only reason that our, not only does do our favorite artists they make great music, great art, but like the only thing that really matters is that people uh, respect them, know them, and want to pay money to go and see them. And so once you have an audience that is passionate about what you do, whether that be online, offline, both, and it obviously scales up and down depending on what in, what uh, genre you might be in, but like once you have that audience that's willing to support you like that, like you can do whatever you want. Like it's the sky is the limit uh, once you find your people and you continue to make great work. So that's what that book's about. So we'll, we'll kind of circle back on that in a couple of weeks and I'll keep talking about it between now and then for sure. But I don't know if people know about this and I learned about this this morning, this afternoon. Uh, there's a record w by Curtis Fuller that I had not known about. Uh, Curtis Fuller and Hampton Hawes with French horns is the name of the record. I didn't know about this record. Only a European release. So um, but there's only one track on um, YouTube. The one track I listened to is alto, trombone and two French horns. What are five trombone solos every trombone should learn? There's two ways to approach this, and I think both are important. One would be to pick five trombonists and do five solos of each because you want to go deep on somebody to actually begin to learn their style, to learn how their, the way that they work, their language works, the way that they interact with the rhythm section, different things that I would call their like isms, you know, like little things that make it like them, like Curtis, da 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 da, or da 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 do. And he goes, do da 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 da. There's other things that make it kind of like, courtesy, you know, Curtis Fullery. Uh, so everybody has those things. And to get into those details, I think it takes several solos. So I would say pick five trombonists and do five solos of each rather than just say, what are five solos? Um, but if you want to go top line, like just starting to investigate some jazz, I would say there could be five solos and I would pick one, you know, from five different people. There's many solos that kind of serve a similar function, but um, if I'm starting with a beginner, we start with Miles Davis on So What. Uh, we're trying to get the feel, the flow, the simplicity, hearing how to transcribe, how to do that. It's not a long solo. It's very melodic, medium tempo. So Miles Davis on So What. Um, I think there's a lot of possible JJ solos. I like blue trombone, maybe not the whole thing, but you know, playing a blues, getting, getting that. I like Curtis Fuller on Blue Train. I like Curtis Fuller on... Flash by after dark is a nice solo on that if you're looking for like a minor blues so that's okay that's like four but i would say that's three and then i'll do a something slide hampton i like that solo there's my blues he's got a great solo hugh gore is another curtis beginning curtis solo my blues or you don't know what love is really depends on the level like if it's a super young student you can't go this advanced probably and then if you want to like learn the history you're gonna, I gotta, you gotta check out something Lawrence Brown, you gotta check out something Vic Dickinson, you gotta check out something uh, Benny Green, you gotta check out something um, Jack Teagarden, you gotta check out something Kid Ori, maybe the Dickie Wells Blues. There's so many things, so d nail it down to five, it really depends on the goal of the person, what their strengths are, what they can already do, what they need to be able to do to get them to where they're trying to get to. So it's kind of a question that needs uh, a little more detail, you know. Taylor's question, though, it's kind of a complicated question, about not being able to see your progress. That's why it's important to make recordings. If you listen to recordings of yourself every three months or every six months, and I don't mean just like random recordings, 
you know, of a gig, but something where you really put your best effort forward. You can do this with practice too, like make a practice journal where you record your progress every day on something. But seeing your, you can only see it upon reflection. I think it's absolutely true. That's why you keep a practice journal to log everything that you've done. That's why you learn tunes so you have some check marks. That's why you learn, do deep dives on a solo or you learn a whole record to give yourself, because it's so invisible, you gotta give yourself some, some check marks, some, some things to aspire to, some things to um, accomplish along the way that are measurable, you know, because that's so invisible and it's 100% true. You do, your development is not linear and it doesn't all happen on the same, it doesn't even happen on the same plane or the same trajectory. You have your concept or your musicianship or your artistry, you have your technical ability, right? And so you might just separate it to like your horn and your ears or your head, right? So it's like the more you learn, the better you get at your instrument or your, your voice or piano or whatever. The better you get, the more things you can do, then you can catch up to your, to your concept. So you have a concept of what you want to play, how you want to play, and you catch up to it. And then from there, it advances. While you're catching up, it keeps moving. So you're constantly chasing the concept in your head. And then some people stop thinking about the concept and their artistry and they maybe stop practicing and this starts to go down. So their technical ability goes down and this never changes. So it can go up and down, you know, depending on what you're doing. But the ideal thing, I suppose, is that you're gonna in increase your artistry over time, especially as a music student, is, is this question is about being a music student. So as you, you know, get more and more into the music and into learning the music, your concept will keep elevating and you're gonna have to catch up with your technique. And that's what I find is diff most difficult often uh, is um, catching up, you know, you've got to, yes, it's one thing to know something theoretically, it's one thing to be able to tell me the answer to a question, but can you play it? Can you do it? You know, you know this from the class we're doing, an improv class, it's like, we're, we play things that are seemingly simple, you put them a little bit into a context and all of a sudden they become infinitely harder, because you never actually learned the things and to a point where you don't have to think about them. So you have to learn these things, these technical things, to a point where you can, they're automatic. And once they're automatic, then you can apply them contextually to various situations. And so your concept evolves, you learn more things, your concept evolves and you learn more things. So that's invisible. Because all of a sudden you'll be like, oh, I never used to be able to play that. But really it's, I never used to be able to hear that. And now I hear that. And now I can you know, aspire to hear something else. Favorite neighborhoods in New York? I always liked where we lived, man. We lived on a, Upper West Side, Morningside Heights. I always liked it over there. I always wanted be to be in Manhattan, you know, but it's kind of a drag sometimes to get all the way uptown. So I kind of liked being a little bit like half uptown, half far. Assuming you're an introvert, how important is awareness of your surroundings when you must rely on your musical thoughts with no judgment? Well, if you aren't aware of your surroundings as a musician, it's really hard to play with the other musicians. So I think that listening and being a present in the moment with the other musicians is the most important question. How do you engage and be in the moment with those musicians? And that doesn't really have anything to do with your personality of being introverted or extroverted. That is knowing the context of what needs to happen in the music to make it exciting and interesting and pull the music along. What jazz standard do you hate the most? Anything in the key of B flat. <laughs> what standards do I not like to play? maybe is another question. I don't know that it's because they're bad, they're bad tunes or anything like that. Like I don't like There Is No Greater Love. I don't like that song. And it's not because it's a bad song, it's just like I think there are other more interesting songs. I don't know if I hate any of them really. A song from my father, people get lost on a lot. I don't really like that, but it has nothing to do with the song. It has to do with people getting lost. Or Doxy, that can be kind of gr a little bit of a, a grind after a while. But I would say if I had to pick one thing that irritates me the most is a B-flat blues because mostly because you hear it so often and you hear it played poorly so often. What are the most underground deep cut records slash players? You know, it's sometimes it's really hard for me to even know who's that deep underground or not anymore, especially in the trombone world, because sometimes they'll say something about Marshall Jilks and people say that he, they don't know about him, like that don't play trombone. And that's like interesting to me. Sometimes like students don't know about Maria Schneider. And then so that all of a sudden, that's like something that I thought was totally mainstream. 
but then they don't know people don't know about them and then i'm like okay am i just like just assuming that people will know about people that i think are should people should know about but it's kind of confusing so sometimes I, I i just mean to say that sometimes i don't know who is underground there's a group called the westerlies i don't know how much people know about them and they play interesting music i don't know for some people like lucas pino is underground he's a great tenor player in new york or his wife roxy cost people don't know about her some people do, some people don't. It's really hard for me to say anymore. I mean, if we're talking about like older stuff, I think Julian Priester is one. Lawrence Brown is underappreciated. Vic Dickinson, Dickie Wells, you know, these guys, these older guys, you know, Gratian Moncor, um, Melba Liston, you know, these type of these type of cats, like people don't people don't know about necessarily, you know. You get into like the big, you know, JJ Curtis slide. Or, like, you get into, you know, Coltrane, Sonny Rollins. And like, there's so many other people, you know, that were out there doing things. It's hard to say. It's, so it's, like, it's hard when it gets distilled down, you know. Or, like, even right behind me, there's, like, Donald Harrison and Terrence Blanchard. Like, those people are people everybody should know, but I don't know. Some people don't know who Terrence Blanchard is. I don't know how they don't know, but it's true. When you improvise, how do you choose thinking the concepts you know what will work versus relying on your ideas, knowing they will work if you trust in your own abilities? I mean, for me, it's all about improvising is all about being prepared, man. You have to know what's going to work, but you also have to be OK with sounding bad. You have to do both, I think, is the answer. You have to be OK with sounding bad. And sometimes that means like in school, that's a great place to sound bad because you got people around you that are going to support you and they want you to sound good. On the bandstand, not a great place to sound bad. Related question, when you, do you record yourself when you practice? And if you do, when do you listen back to it? Do I record myself when I practice? Yes. Do I do all the time? No. I know a lot of people that record all their gigs and listen to it right afterwards so they can get in and listen to it. I need some space. It's not helpful to me if I'm, because I'm always self-effacing. Like, oh, it wasn't very good. Oh, it wasn't very good. Need a little space. So like a couple days later, listen back and be like, all right, did it, feel, did it sound like what I felt it sounded like? How close was I? Was my, was my perception anywhere near reality in that situation, you know? Because sometimes it is. And it's like, actually, that was a good gig. Or sometimes like, wow, I didn't sound as good as I thought I sounded. It happens both ways, you know? You think your things are not going well when they do, so. I do listen back to my practice less now than I used to, but um, I do record myself, especially when I'm getting ready to make a record, because I want to hear what I sound like so I can actually self-assess, you know? But I also like I make a lot of content and concerts and live stream and blah, 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 do a lot of things. So I'm hearing myself just kind of constantly through making stuff, you know, so like even if I'm not recording my practice session, I'm kind of saying like, oh, like you're slipping, man. Like <laughs> what's going on? You know, you need to get your your chops together uh, from Richard. I've been working on Rush Shoot or Etudes recently. Do you recommend going through the book in order or skip around? Yeah, skip around. I've never I never play number one. I hate number one. Don't play Rush Shoot number one. It doesn't sound like the rest of the book. I don't do it in order. They weren't meant to be in order. They're just numbers. The Roshu, man. That was on J.J. Johnson's music stand. That's what I've always heard. Roshu. And I'm starting to get dig deeper into Arbenz. So Roshu and Arbenz. I love Bish. I love Bach. Anything Bach. Practice that stuff and you're going to be good to go, man. Just curious. I've been talking to a violin player recently about the idea of mental practice, which neither of us know much about. Any thoughts on that or how useful it might be even when it look at it mental practice is super important it's super important in the context of learning a lot of different things but in particular the um, idea of mental practice and like things that are repetitive is important uh, things when I'm trying to learn changes or trying to memorize something running that I need to run through again and again and again and again like your your ability to execute something on the horn is totally separate from your ability to remember something or your ability to process information right like the the technical part of the horn playing is not the same part as the it's not the same things that you're thinking about when you're thinking about okay two five to one two five to four go to the bridge blah 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 what are the changes like those are different things so when i i can walk down the street and i can think through the changes i can walk down the street and sing through a solo i can walk down the street and think about how to resolve different types of dominant chords uh, to other places. So whatever I'm working on is in my mind constantly. And so I'm not just practicing when I'm practicing. I'm practicing all, anything that can be done mentally. A lot of the stuff, I know there's some students watching I see that are in my improv class. So much of the stuff that we do in the improv class is only mental practice. 
the physical part of doing it is a very small part. It's actually knowing what to play. That's the hard part. So yes, I am 100% on board with the mental practice question and the mental practicing uh, game. And I've done it for a long time and I will continue to do, do so because especially you're sitting on an airplane, you can think through the changes. You sit here and think through whatever tune I'm working on, remembering, okay. And it's just like the cycle of going through the changes over and over, hearing the changes, hearing the harmony, hearing the melody, you know, singing the melody, all of those different things, man. You just keep going and going and going. Did making your first record teach you about why the industry is looked at differently when it comes to how to get a product recognized? Yeah, absolutely. Making my first record taught me a lot of things about the industry, about what people care about, what people don't care about. It took me a long time, even till now, to, to process a lot of that. What we think something should be versus what reality looks like versus what, you know, where you should draw the line is a constant a constant conversation, what makes something interesting? Why should Down be right about you? Why don't the New York Times put anything in about jazz except for very rarely? How do I reach that person? How do I make them care? Like the idea of like, I actually have to, you have to make someone care about what you're doing. What you're doing has no intrinsic value to somebody else if they don't have a reason to care, even if you're an amazing artist, you know, you dig what I'm saying? Like that's what I learned. There's like, a million people that can put 10 tunes together and put out a record, but to find a way to do it over and over again, and then to also be able to actually break through the noise, like make somebody care. Why should they care? And answering that question in an interesting way, you know, that's hard. It's ongoing. There's no, I don't have an answer. I'm just saying like, uh, but you learn a lot of things about who to hire, who to trust. Are you tired of playing trombone? Am I tired of playing trombone? I don't think so. I still find joy in playing the trombone. Some days less so. Last page of the practice journal, congrats, that's awesome. Did you develop a shorthand in your practice journal? Yes, if you go back to old journals, can you understand what you wrote? Uh, yeah, yes, for sure. I think as long as you understand what it is, I think it's fine. Shorthand is perfect. As long as you don't forget what you, what you meant by the shorthand. If you get to the end of the journal, maybe you wanna on the back cover or something, write in the code you know, to figure out what you said. So if you go back, you can look. But like I said, I, when I've been into the practice journal vibe, like it's been for short, intense periods of time. And then I um, go away from it and then back and go away from it and come back, you know, um, to track specific progress on specific items. Like I need to develop my practice routine or I need to develop this or that, you know, different, different things. Competitions for college or high school students. Yeah, I mean, the International Trombone Association has great ones, jazz ones. Uh, the Army Blues has a ATW competition. Um, there's the, of course, the Jazz Trombone Day here at UNT. We have a competition for 30 and under for high school students, all state. That's the thing, man. It used to be Grammy Band. They don't really do that anymore. There's New York Youth Orchestra, Jazz, ja New York Youth Jazz Orchestra. There's um, on the West Coast, they have uh, Monterey Next Gen, I think it's called. There's uh, Yamaha sponsors. Uh, Thing. Young Arts is what it's called, sorry. Yeah, Young Arts. There's a, there's many great things like that. Uh, do you think one's musical education affects their enjoyment of jazz music or any style? Yeah, of course. The more you learn about something, the less mysterious it is, which can be good or bad. A hundred percent. Who you're with, who you talk to, who your teachers are, they affect how you perceive music, what you think is important, even if it's, you know, changes over time, you know, and, uh, but a hundred percent your your community affects how you hear things and how you appreciate things um, for good and for bad you know positive and negative whatever i tell you about is if you're in my studio and i'm telling you about different records you might check them out but if you go to study with somebody else they might tell you about other records and it might lead you down different paths you know and i try to be try to just when there's a record that I think might be interesting, I try to like listen to, find it and pull it up so that the student can hear it for at least a couple of seconds, you know? Most interesting conversations talking to non-musicians about music. That's not something I enjoy that much, talking about music to non-musicians. I don't like having those surface level conversations because it comes down to the same thing. Oh, you play trombone? Who do you play with? Are you in a band? You know, that's the common conversation. That's not the one, I, that's not one that I want to have. I'm having a conversation about music someone that appreciates music that's not a musician is different you know you know the kind of the intersection between business and music is somewhere that i enjoy talking about so maybe it's somewhere in there this has been very productive q a thank you for all the great questions but yeah so we'll be back each every tuesday 3 p.m eastern 2 p.m central we're doing these right now 
and uh, we'll be moving towards that book release of Create, Connect, Repeat and kind of moving towards some of those music business topics. But uh, I appreciate everyone being here and hanging out. It's always a pleasure. And uh, I'll catch you all very, very soon. Later.